Well, good morning. Happy Thursday to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us for our RMS uh, live webinar. This one's going to be a little bit different today. It's going to be sort of in a panel style. You've seen this before from Risk Management Services. So we're excited to bring you our take on cybersecurity and in particular, the devastating impact of business email compromise. I'm going to get to my panel here in just a little bit, but just a few housekeeping things. Um, if you don't see the download pod, which usually floats out here on, on the WebEx, you can email us at tacrcs at county.org, and we can email these downloads to you. I'll touch on them towards the end. But again, we want to welcome you to uh, today's show, our live event. Um, one of the things that we always stress when you're with us is this is about you. We are here for you, so we mean that. Post your questions in the chat. You'll see me peek over here just a little bit. And I'll be looking, trying to keep up with your questions, but we want to hit them right as they, they come online. So please, we highly encourage your participation. Uh, our panelists, uh, we're ready to go off script if we need to. But without further ado, I do want to introduce this wonderful, this, this A-rated panel that we've got here. I'm going to start down here, and we've got Ms. Andrea Beard, who is our TAC Legal Liability Claim Supervisor, and also oversees our claims program. Andrea, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And sitting next to her, no, no storm, no sleet, not even Hurricane Ian could keep this panelist from being here with us today. He's a partner managing director at Silent, which is a leading forensic and incident response firm. Mr. Jeff Bernbach. Robert, good morning. Glad to have you with us. And last but certainly not least, she is the uh, legalese whisperer. She's going to be in your corner to guide you should you have a privacy or data security event. Uh, our legal expert, uh, Ms. Lindsay Nickel. Thank you so much. Great, great to be here this morning. And Lindsay is a partner and vice chair uh, with Lewis Brisbos. So uh, for today, again, we're going to be talking about the devastating impact of business email compromise. So let's go ahead and move on. This wouldn't be a TAC presentation, Andrea Wright, without what? Our famous disclaimer. <laughs> so what you're seeing on screen is this disclaimer. What it says is, hey, look, um, in this session, it is educational purposes, for educational purposes. If we happen to talk about coverage, if we happen to talk about a vendor, we're not endorsing any vendor. Uh, we're just using it again for educational purposes. Andrea, if we happen to talk about a coverage scenario, are we making a determination about coverage? No coverage determinations today. We're just talking in general terms. Every claim has to be evaluated on its own merit. Yep, absolutely. And lastly, uh, what we talk about today is not a requirement of coverage. Again, we want to try and hit on some best practices and get you practical things to understand, in this case, what is business email compromise. So for today, here's our learning objectives. Just a few. Uh, one, we want to give you a baseline to understand the mechanics of an email. And Jeff, that's going to be important as we go along in this presentation, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to discuss common signs of BEC. I want to make an apology really quick. We love acronyms, but BEC is business email compromise. So if you hear me refer to that, that's what that means. Then we're going to talk about legal implications if compromised, and then some best practices to protect against BEC. All right. So I'm going to start us off with a quick poll. Again, this is for uh, our attendees. I want to ask you, how many of you have heard of a BEC attack or know what that is? And what I'd like for you to do, I'm going to give you about a minute. Chime in on the chat. Yes, you know what that is. You've heard it or, or no. Just want to get a quick gauge for what that is. Uh, I'm going to go to our panelists while I wait for the official results. Where do you think this is going to be in terms of, do you think our... our Members or attendees have heard of a BEC. What do you think, Andrea? What's your prediction? I think I think the majority have heard of it. Okay. To what degree is questionable, but they've heard of it. Okay. Jeff? I'd agree. I think Andrea's spot on. Okay. And Lindsay? And I think most will have heard of it or heard of something similar. They may not know that this is what we call it. Ah. Um, so uh, introducing folks to our acronyms and jargon um, as we discuss it, I think folks have heard of these scenarios but may not know it has a name inside right. the cyber industry. 
Excellent. Well, uh, I'm, I'm looking here at the official results. Kind of feels like this is maybe like elections night. The, the polls are coming in here. Um, but yes, I mean, from the crowd here, and thank you for chiming in again. We welcome your participation. Uh, it's an overwhelming yes. They have heard of a BEC. So to, to those of you joining us virtually from across the state, that's wonderful to hear because I think that goes a long way in this discussion about cybersecurity. And look, this is just a piece of cybersecurity, but we really want to focus in on it because it's an important piece. Okay, so what you're seeing on your screen here is, well, frankly, there, there are some different numbers between BEC and ransomware. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to Jeff with this here. Jeff, you know, on the screen you see ransomware, $49.2 million in in losses for its victims, and BEC, an astounding 2.4. Does that surprise you any? No, I think, if anything, those numbers are low. I think they're probably underreported. Uh, keep in mind, that's the information the FBI has based on what's been reported to them. Uh, in many cases, this stuff goes underreported by, uh, you know, an order of magnitude. Could be 10 times more. Okay. Andrea, did this surprise you any? It actually did surprise me. Um, Ransomware seems to be the big, scary beast. Mm -hmm. so you would think that the numbers on it would be bigger. But BEC, I would say our claims, uh, in general, we have more BEC claims than we do ransomware. You just don't expect the losses themselves to be that number. Number high, yes, but the loss number, not so high. Interesting. So what you, what's coming across your desk is more of the business email compromise. From what Definitely. I would say eight out of 10 of our claims are a business email compromise. Yep. So take note, audience, that that is what we're seeing, uh, Andrea is seeing come across your desk with quite frequency. Lindsay, from your perspective, did these numbers surprise you at all? I'd actually never seen this report, and I think it's incredibly interesting, and it really, really highlights why the title of this presentation is Devastating Impact. Um, because I agree with Andrea, we see more business email compromises than ransomware, but ransomware has a more outwardly focused catastrophic effect. BECs are very internal to an organization most of the time, um, but they are absolutely focused on financial gain to the criminal actors. So when you consider that as the goal mm -hmm. um, and the multiplier, how many of these there are, um, that that number, I'm with Jeff, it's probably higher because there's probably a lot of organizations that don't report them. Um, but it really, really illustrates why this particular type of threat can be so devastating. Interesting. And, and Lindsay's taking us, she's touching right on the why. The why is BEC so unknown or underreported? So, so Jeff, again, from your perspective, uh, what, what, any other thing to add as to why it might be unknown or underreported compared to, to ransomware, which we hear all the time? Probably. I think in a lot of cases, when IT hears that a phishing message has gone out of someone's mailbox, they don't really think of it as a crime. They just go in and basically reset the passwords uh, and keep going uh, without really stopping in some cases to look and see, okay, is there something here that's more, more malicious, more nefarious? Okay. So kind of, you know, that's their SOP, standard operating procedure. We've got an issue. Um, but we may not be looking at it on a bigger scale, right? Could this be leading to something else? Sure. I mean, you know, a fish does not come out of someone's mailbox by itself. We, <laughs> we've talked about this before. So I think in that point, you know, IT needs to start looking and say, okay, did a threat actor actually get in there? And if so, what do they do? Interesting. Andrea, so when we look at the numbers here, just the numbers, and again, I agree, I think this is from 2021, the FBI's Internet Crime Report. Uh, this was only what was reported does BEC have maybe a, a component compared to ransomware that it's embarrassing because sort of like I was conned, I was duped. Would you agree with that? I would definitely agree with that. We know that, especially here in tech, we have training that teaches us don't click. So it's embarrassing to actually click and then go, oh, that's one I shouldn't have clicked on. That's why I'm doing that training. So it is a very embarrassing and one of the reasons why it's not reported. And, and just to add on to that, ransomware, at least kind of when we hear it probably, we associate that possibly with a nation threat actor, some, someone overseas, someone foreign. And so there's that, uh, you know, natural defense as opposed to BEC, which is more internal, it seems, uh, but can be probably just as devastating. Would, would we all agree with that? Yeah, I think many times that with a ransomware event, you're not going to keep that quiet. 
Uh, you know, everybody in the organization knows they can't get on the network. Uh, people start talking, news media starts calling, things of that nature. Whereas a business email compromise is usually more contained, doesn't get the media attention. It kind of maybe percolates underneath the surface and they're really symptoms of a bigger issue, right? But at the time, it may not register that, hey, something is really going on. Could be a precursor to something else. Lindsay, Absolutely. would you agree? Absolutely. So, and I think we're going to talk about this more, but um, we, you know, we're looking at this report from the perspective of financial losses associated with business email compromise. Um, but targeted attacks on email inboxes focus not just on uh, perpetrating a financial fraud or a wire transfer fraud, but they can also be used um, as precursors to ransomware attacks or other types of threat to the system. Um, in a lot of ways, email is one of the biggest doors to a network, um, and so there's a lot of risks that go with it. Understanding this risk and understanding ways to prevent it um, are critical to protecting a network. And I think the counties in general, and a lot of people just in general, they're unaware of the implications of an email compromise and how big mm -hmm. it can be, and especially the legal ramifications of what it can lead to. They're just uh, unaware of what that can mean for an organization. So it's really important that they realize there are legal implications that can come into play when their email has been compromised. So Lindsay was, was touching on something, and I'm going to go to Jeff with this one here. So from a technical perspective, and again, we promised you not going to be a quiz. We won't ask you to remember anything on, from a technical side. But again, it's important to understand how difficult, Jeff, is it to execute a BEC attack? In most cases, uh, threat actors only really need a username and a password. Uh, if you don't have multi-factor authentication, there's really nothing else that's going to keep threat actors out. Now, we know historically most people use the same sets of username, password, we call credentials, over and over again. Uh, you know, and these days, typically your email address is your username, so they already have half the equation. Uh, if they can figure out your password, and if it's your kid or your favorite sports team or your dog or some derivative of that, they're going to get it pretty quickly. Okay, Jeff, I'm going to make myself a note that I need to change a few passwords uh, based on that. So not good practice. We'll talk afterwards. <laughs> okay, appreciate that. I may need a little bit of remedial training on that. But to, to that point, so you're really highlighting that a BEC is, is not what we think as a, you know, for someone being in a basement, hovering over a computer, pounding out code, drinking Mountain Dew. It's, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. It's very simple to do. And, and does, is that to say that then there's probably a, a high degree of a, uh, being successful with a BEC attack? Yeah. In a lot of cases, the threat actors get into an email account, and the account user is unaware of it for an extended period of time. I mean, weeks, months. We've seen it as long as eight months, almost a year in some cases. So, Andrea, if I'm hearing Jeff right, if, if we've got a relatively low threshold uh, to be able to execute these, does this mean that as a county our Texas counties, do they stand a greater chance of suffering a BEC attack versus a ransomware attack from where you sit on the claim side? Uh, yes, I think they do, and it's because of their employees, the human factor. Humans are the weakest link in these kind of scenarios because it's, it's all about clicking and doing, taking a step that you shouldn't be doing, that you're inevitably going to do. Humans, the weakest link. <sighs> Lindsay, so from, from your side, how do we, you know, if, if we've got the technical side, hardware and software, but if, if, if someone does click from a legal perspective, uh, are the potential outcomes, the negative ones, still the same, whether it's BEC or ransomware attack? Can it be just as devastating and how? It absolutely can be. And this is where I think there's some misconceptions about business email compromise, um, because uh, like Jeff alluded to earlier, there are a lot of organizations that they'll see a fish go out, IT will change a password, and they think they've solved the problem. Unfortunately, there's a lot more going on with a lot of business email compromises. Um, when threat actors get into the environment and they hang out there for a while, uh, weeks or months at a time, um, they're doing a number of different things. Uh, they're running searches through the email. They're conducting reconnaissance. They may be putting in forwarding rules that would actually send emails out of the environment. And in some situations, depending on the technical settings and how the threat actors work, they actually could download the entire contents of that email account to a device located somewhere else. Um, and when that happens, depending on what is in that email account, now we have not just 
a, a hack of our system and potentially a financial loss, but we also potentially have a data breach that requires reporting. And those are the types of legal ramifications that some organ organizations don't consider. Wow. So we've got an attack that is easier, ostensibly, to execute, but can have the same far-reaching negative impacts. And in part, again, we go back to what Andrea said, it's because of the human factor, right? When we talk about emails, let's be honest, um, our emails in many cases, Jeff, have become a repository for, for a lot of different things on there, right? Going back years and years. And so when someone gets in there, we don't know really what we have in there. No, you know, it's not unusual for counties uh, to have a, a large range of personal information. We call PII, personally identifiable information. Uh, you know, veteran services may have discharge information, DD-214s. It may have information on physical health, mental health, lots of different things. Uh, the HR department's going to have information that can be injurious if it gets out. Law enforcement has lots of things. So it's not unusual for people to receive things via their email, even though they don't ask for them, that could put the county in a problematic situation if they should be exfiltrated. Andrea, to you, kind of along the same vein, when you've seen claims, how many times have we seen it where there was this critical data in there? And our first question is, what do you have any of this? And as we dig forensically, what was the results? A lot of times, once we determine the email has been touched, exfiltrated, we start to ask the employees, what kind of work do you do? What's in your email? Do you think there is any personal, personal identifiable information in there? Most of the time, they're like, no, I don't transfer. I wouldn't that have of, that. Right. <laughs> Right, that's, that's not in my email. Well, to, uh, it's better to be safe than sorry. So we'll take a copy of the email and we'll go through it. And it turns out there's information in there that they either forgot about, they didn't realize was on a, an attachment that was sent to them. It could be an Excel spreadsheet that has information on it they didn't realize was on there. Most of the time there is something in there. And let, let's pause there for a little bit and I'm going to look at our chat. I don't have any questions, but that something that we keep referring to is, is data, right? Data is king. And, and Lindsay, from your perspective, uh, do our counties, what kinds of data do they have? So the counties have some of the most critical data that our society is built on. Um, so in addition to just the personal information of all the employees who work there, um, the counties are the, often the repository for some of the most critical information, property records, prison records, um, court records, um, all of those things that are absolutely critical. Um, and, and while they may not all be in email accounts, as we've already alluded to, sometimes that information is in email just because of the normal day-to-day -day course of business. And the user may not really recall that there was a spreadsheet with social security numbers on it or um, court records that were transferred that might have been sealed and aren't public. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that sensitive information can get into an email account just in the normal course of business. And if we face a business email compromise and we determine that that email account is exfiltrated, um, it's difficult, it's difficult to process to figure out what's there, but it also can be a lot more far reaching than anyone really imagines. It's a scary thought. And, and I think what we always try to do is, is connect it back to you, the individual attendee here, is that it, it is your information that's somewhere stored digitally in your own county, along with your citizens that are in that county. So you, you have it all they want it, and, and Jeff, that's what's being monetized, right? It is. It is. You know, they want the data. Uh, they also want to be able to go in and basically hijack conversations and redirect payments, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there's a couple different motivations for business email compromise. Okay. So I'm um, going to take us here to the next screen. So what you're going to see here, and, and it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we want to give you um, some ways, some tips to possibly sniff out a business email compromise. Um, these, I, I want to make again a mini disclaimer that these aren't all uh, and that hackers are constantly evolving their tactics, Jeff, right? So yeah. these might work today, but they might be limited, you know, down the road because of how quickly they adapt. But talk to us a little bit about time sensitive, a covert request. What, what's potentially that indicative of? Well, the threat actors are trying to send through a fish and they're trying to motivate you to click on it. 
Uh, so they're trying to say something along the lines of, I'm going to be on an airplane, you can't reach me, but I need you to look at this right away. Trying to get you to hurry to make a mistake. Or don't tell anybody about this, but I need you to do something for me. Those types of things usually should be red flags. And, and Lindsay, because it's email, I, it's, there's probably a good success rate because we're all so busy. Email is constantly bombarding us all day, every day. And we move as quickly through it as we possibly can because that's what our jobs require us to do. And so when we're moving through email quickly, if we're not taking the time to pause and look for signs of business email compromise, look for these types of signs that will alert someone to the fact that this email is suspicious, um, it may be targeting you, it may be a fish, um, we can overlook things really, really quickly. Andrea, I'm going to come to you now as we bring back up the uh, common signs of BEC. So we see there in the middle, grammatical errors, spelling mistakes, uh, direct messages from vendors. But let's go to the first one. You know, how has that changed even recently? Well, you used to be able to identify a phishing email almost immediately. There would be grammatical errors through it. You could hover over the email address and it would look nothing like the legit email address and it was just a very poorly written and poorly formatted email in general that has changed substantially now it is very hard to tell a fake email from a legit email and not only that I mean if they're actually in the legit email you're not going to be able to tell it anyway so it is a lot harder to identify because that has evolved so much so it sounds like they may have found or learned how to use spell checker it may be what that sounds like. They've taken, some, <laughs> they've taken some Microsoft Word classes and are doing a much better job now. Well, but I think this underscores, you know, Jeff and Lindsay, what you guys see on a day-to-day -day basis is, is that these threat actors are highly adaptive. Mm -hmm. And they're able to customize and, and really hone in on our human weaknesses, that social engineering aspect that they're able to really get adept at. Uh, and, and Jeff, from, from the BEC side, it sounds like this is a pretty wide net that they can cast relatively easy. Is that a true statement? It really is. Yeah. Once they can get into someone's email account, they'll do a couple of things. Typically, they'll go ahead and they'll forward incoming mail back out. So from that point forward, they're seeing everything that's coming in and out of your box as one of the things they'll do. They'll also go ahead and possibly redirect inbound email to obfuscate any mail that might make you suspicious that someone's in the box. So you know, there's a lot of things they can do to, uh, to garner information. Uh, in some situations, they'll go ahead and they'll actually synchronize to that mailbox. And Lindsay can certainly talk to that in, in detail, but th that can become catastrophic because now basically what that means is the threat actors have a copy of everything that was ever saved in that box. And that can go back for years and years. And only takes one and they've got a payday. That's it. Right? All it takes is just one. Now, we're going we're gonna to walk you through the scenario of a BEC, so you'll be able to visually see that, and that, that's coming up here for us. But before we leave this slide, and again, these are, again, six common signs of a business email compromise. They're not foolproof, uh, and we do caveat that down there. But again, it's that training, that human aspect. So I'm going to go to, to Lindsay on this. You know, we've got human aspects, and these are human-driven behaviors. Why can't we simply rely on technology, hardware and software to stop these attacks? So we can do a lot of things technologically. Um, and there are a lot of options available in, in email programs like Office 365 that can help us screen for malicious attachments, screen for spoofed email addresses. But fundamentally, and I think one of the things about this particular list is you can almost see the progression of how the criminal actors have developed different tactics. We have to always assume that they're going to continue to modify and adapt. And we can't take humans out of the day-to-day -day workplace. Um, I, I don't think any of us want robots to take over the world. Um, and most of us want to have something productive to do during the day. Um, so what we have to do is create that human firewall. We have to do training, um, not just about these signs, but you know, interactive training, lessons about the importance of cybersecurity, lessons about what, what can happen when you click on something that has been sent by someone who is, has malicious intent. And then we have to create the culture about this. We need to make sure everyone's invested in the security of the network and the systems and that we create a culture of communication about it. 
if someone clicks on an email that they shouldn't, number one, that's a very human thing to do. We're talking about how skilled these emails are, right. and they are. They are designed to fool people. That is the goal. If we empower people to communicate about when they make a mistake, it is much easier to stop catastrophic consequences. If someone clicks on a link or an attachment and puts in their credentials and realizes it 30 seconds later, we want them to pick up the phone and call IT and say, I think I made a mistake because I'd rather change that password within the next couple of minutes than find out six months later that we've had a bad guy hanging in that email account just because someone was afraid to admit they might have made a mistake. It's a great point there, and, and what I pick up on is that you've got process and technology, but at the end of the day, it always comes back to people. And Jeff, you know, as a cybersecurity expert, um, we, you, we could probably have an IT professional for every county employee, and it still wouldn't be enough because it just takes a click. Yeah, people make mistakes. Uh, you know, they're fast, they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're overstressed, they've got a lot going on, they're running back and forth, dealing with kids and jobs and family and all those things, and it just takes a second, and the bad guys are in. Jeff, you know, I read a report recently that it says it takes about an average 10 hours for a threat actor to find a weakness, and once they're inside, about 90 minutes before they start moving pretty quick and infecting other areas. I mean, that's pretty quick uh, movement on their part. We've seen threat actors get into an email and in under three minutes get everything they need and never have to go back into that account again. That's scary. That's, that's really scary. And I think that goes back to the theme of this panel and, and why we wanted to bring it to you. Andrea wanted to, to bring this is that business email compromise, we're not hearing much about it, but it is far reaching, highly adaptive and can get everything that they need in such a small matter of time. So as we're going to transition here now to what does a BEC look like? Okay, so on your screen, you've, it kind of looks like a cartoon, but think of this as the X's and O's of, of a simple uh, vanilla uh, BEC. So Jeff, uh, uh, walk us through what we've got here. Okay, so we've got Bob and Carol, and they're emailing back and forth to each other, and they're arranging a payment of some sort. It could be for an invoice, it could be for a grant, it could be any number of things. And Bob thinks he's talking to Carol, and Carol thinks she's talking to Bob. But Bob gets fished, our threat actor Boris, the fellow in red. And Boris manages to get in there and create an imposter for Bob. So suddenly Carol's no longer emailing Bob, she's emailing the imposter. And somewhere along the way, the imposter will go ahead and change where that payment should get made to. Uh, Carol's none the wiser and she ends up sending the money and it never gets to Bob, it gets to Boris's imposter. Just that simple. Just that simple. Just that simple. Andrea, do we see this pretty frequently? We see this very frequently, and, unfortunately. And what's the result for a county should they be impacted? Are, are we talking nominal amounts of money? Or are we talking big money here, potentially? It can be nominal. It just depends on what they're asking for and, and what's taking place. But we've seen it in the six figures. The six figures in, in, in a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. And so, Jeff Lindsay, when that threat actor is, is receiving the money, uh, is that headed to a bank overseas? Uh, can we get it back? So that's a really good question, and, and it can head a number of places. Okay. Sometimes those wiring instructions that are changed in the middle of the conversation will move money to an overseas bank, but most of the time we see local banks, names that we all know. Um, you know, we're going to, Boris as acting as the imposter there will say, you know, we changed our bank account and we're not at Wells Fargo anymore. We're at Bank of America. Send it over here. Um, or we're at Chase or Compass or um, something like that. And once the money hits, um, we have a very, very small window of time that we might be able to recover it. Um, generally, if, if the fraudulent wire is detected within, say, 24 to 48 hours, we might have a little time on the outside of 48, but our chances are much better under 48 hours. Um, we have the ability to um, activate the FBI financial fraud kill chain. Um, Jeff and I both have FBI contacts. We're happy to leverage for any county that faces something like this. Um, if it's quick enough and we can get to the FBI, they can freeze those funds and get them back. Um, it is not common, though because very often these types of transfers aren't detected for quite some time. Um, sometimes it takes weeks or even months before um, 
Bob realizes that he never got his money. And he calls Carol one day and says, hey, you didn't pay our, our invoice. And Carol says, yes, I did. Bob says, no, you didn't. And that's when things unravel. And that's when we figure out that this whole scenario took place um, and that the money was sent to the wrong place. That's the aha moment. So a yes. lot to unpack there, and I, and I want to go back and, and hit on a, a couple of things there. So you talk about it being, you know, it may not be a bank overseas. It could be a, a, maybe a bank in a regional bank, a bank that we know very well. So knowing your vendors, having a relationship with your vendors, is that a critical aspect of circumventing possibly a BEC? Absolutely critical. Knowing your vendors and knowing that you have trustworthy contact information for them. Because when these, when these phishing emails and then the fraudulent communications come through in the chain, um, very often these threat actors will change the signature line and they'll put their own phone number at the bottom. Um, so we encourage everyone to verify all wiring payments, but to use it using known trustworthy contact information. That's devious. Very devious. That is devious. Jeff, so you're telling me that they'll put in maybe a, a potential website or a number that yeah. is... Phone number, email, all types of things. A lot of times what they'll do is once they get into an account, they may go ahead and create a, a look-alike domain so that they can take over the email communication. So you can imagine if you have uh, Cartwright County, mm -hmm. W-R-I-G-H-T. Well, instead of a W, they'll go ahead and register a domain with two Vs. When you look at it closely, two lowercase Vs looks like a W, and people will never catch up on it. Again, they, they seem to be firing on all cylinders and have thought of almost everything when it comes to these types of attacks. So, so Andrea, if, you know, on the claim side, if you were talking to a county, what's your number one thing that you want them to focus on when it comes to BEC in terms of trying to circumvent to prevent a BEC attack? Training. Definitely. One more time. Training, training, yeah. training. It's very important. You have to get your employees into the habit of looking for these things, of, of pausing and not clicking. I understand the email. I, I am inundated with emails on a daily basis myself. It is very easy to just roll through and knock out your work. And before you know it, you've actually clicked on or opened something that you should not have. It's a great point. You know, you look at those elected offices in, in our counties, the treasurer's office, the auditor's office, any office, the tax office over at the JP's office. If you're handling financial transactions, data, you're authorizing payments, now is a good time to look at those protocols that you have in place. Uh, do a refresher training with your staff. Um, what's your plan for new onboarding training? Those are the things that kind of low-hanging fruit that we can affect on, on a day-to-day -day basis to stay sharp with this. And don't think that one training cuts it. This has to be continual. It has to be repetitive. That's a good so point. When I hear this, it really does sound like, Jeff, this isn't, this can't be just the sole responsibility of IT. It really takes all of us. Yeah, anybody who has an email account needs to be, you know, vigilant, bottom line. Well, now let's look at our next X's and O's. Jeff, what's the difference here? What am I seeing? Because there's a lot going on here. Yeah, well, you've got Bob and Carol. They're still talking about that same transaction. And, of course, Boris goes ahead and fishes Bob. But he also then creates two imposters in this case, a fake Bob and a fake Carol. Why would he do that? Well, because this way one party doesn't get suspicious if they don't get ongoing continual communication. So Bob is dealing now with a fraudulent Carol. Carol's dealing with a fraudulent Bob. Uh, it takes a while to unwind something like this. They can become very, very complex. So deceiving both sides of the equation, the sender and receiver. So no one is ever aware of the fact that the money didn't go where it's supposed to go. Okay. Interesting. And so as we move along here, then it, it kind of goes back into the same flow. Yeah. And if you notice, there's that red bar basically trying to graphically depict... Bob and Carol, the legitimate parties, never get to communicate with each other from that point forward. And the end result is the same. Money goes out, Lindsay. And again, I want to go back to we've got a very short window to even try, attempt to possibly get some of these funds back. So if, you're, if you've got cyber coverage with the pool, you recommend their first call should be to, to Andrea, to TAC. 100%. 
the, the minute this is detected, get on the phone to Andrea, call TAC. Um, leverage the resources that are available through TAC to answer questions about how this happened, to verify that the environment is secure, and to try to recover funds. And we'll do what we can to try to do that. So this goes back to, and, and I'm going to say, if you're hearing a pounding, it's because that's people knocking down the door trying to get in here to see this live panel webinar. It's that good, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, no, seriously, I mean, it, it really does go back to see something, say something, right? Does it not? Yes. Yeah, it does. Yes. You know, if, if you get any kind of a request to redirect payment, you've got to validate, you've got to verify. You've got to stop and pick up the phone. And don't use the phone number that's on the invoice. Use a known phone number for a known contact uh, and make certain the information you're getting is legitimate. Yep. So for if you're a county leader, an elected or appointed official, a department head, if you're IT on with us, this is where you've got to have a holistic approach for your county on do our employees know what to do when they see something like this? Don't dismiss it as just something, you know, here occurring on your laptop. It really could be a precursor to something bigger. Absolutely. Okay. So that, that's, that's another tip there for you. We've got one more illustration here. Uh, Jeff, what are, what are we looking at? All right. So the idea here is that if you have a, a phishing message and you don't have really good mail filtering to catch that phishing message, uh, it could have a malicious payload to it. It could be just designed to steal credentials. But it could be designed to do a lot of things. So, you know, this is a vector we also see for ransomware coming in. So you really need to be on top of your game. You know, there's really five different scenarios that can play out. Uh, the vacuum, of course, is to depict the idea that they're <laughs> sucking data out of your environment, uh, which is more often than not a, a real possibility. We've seen that a lot in the past. So, Jeff, real quick, I'm going to stop you there. So the BEC could be sort of opening the door for what we're seeing here unfolding. All these different types. Okay, of all right, go so on. Once they're in a, in a mail account, uh, they can go ahead and they can steal data, which of course becomes very problematic for a number of reasons Lindsay mentioned. There's also the possibility to encrypt data. Well, then you really get into a ransomware type of situation. Uh, another possibility is stealing credentials. And when they steal credentials, they can use that to do a lot of things. Uh, you know, how many of us have never gone ahead and checked our personal bank account from our corporate or county email system, or okay. computer system. All so right. those credentials are cached in your browser. They can scrape all those back out, and then you have a whole host of other problems to contend with. Uh, of course, they can spread throughout the network moving laterally, which, of course, is very injurious. And then finally, they may just be using your contacts to send out more fish. It's interesting how many times we see counties get hit, and we see other counties get hit subsequent to the first county because they're all basically communicating similar information to each other. Right. So many of our counties are sharing information back and forth. So that really underscores, and I think, this, this concept of um, doesn't matter where you are, what size of county you are, what your general fund looks like, they can reach out and touch you at any moment in time. And it may not be just because they were looking at Lone Star County as, a, as the target I wanted. They just found you through an email. Mm -hmm. They're crimes of opportunity. Nobody really is setting out and saying, we're going to go get the big counties. The idea that we could be what we call secure, uh, security through obscurity. We're so small, no one's really going to bother us. That no longer holds true. Those days are gone because we live in a digital world that every day connects us more and more. And so, Lindsay, from your side, as we come become more digitally connected, that means that there's more responsibility on, on us to, to secure these things, is there not? Absolutely. Um, it's understanding that because of the interconnectivity, um, any size county, any day of the week could be a target. Um, like Jeff said, they're crimes of opportunity. So if a fish gets into an email account and then conducts another phishing expedition, that email may send out emails to everyone in the contact list. And everyone in the contact list could be every county in the state of Texas very easily, which now means that we're seeing big counties, mid-sized, small counties, all facing the same kind of attack and same kind of um, malicious activity. And I would say that on a claim side, <clears throat> yep. most of our claims have been mid to small counties. It's not yep. been the large not counties. the big ones. So if we look at this from an analogy standpoint, think of think of a shirt that's got a, a loose thread. And the more you pull on it, it just keeps going and going and going. And, and you've got to stop that. And the way to stop that or mitigate that is is with training. But Jeff, I want to go back to 
uh, this infographic here, you know, stealing credentials, you, you manage, you said passwords. So one of the questions I often get is, Robert, should we use a password manager? Really quick, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you need to have a password manager, but I think even more importantly, you need to have multi-factor authentication in okay. place. These days, if you just have a username and a password without multi-factor, which would be some other piece of information you have with you, typically it's a code on a phone, but it could be a, a key, it could be a number of different things. But if you don't have multi-factor authentication in place, it's not a function of if you will have a problem, it is when, almost guaranteed. And, and I think the other side of that equation when it comes to our credentials is recognizing that as humans, uh, we're probably reusing the same password at work, at home, or vice versa. I mean... The average person only has five different sets of credentials. They usually have their email as their username, so that's half the equation. Uh, so if you've ever had uh, you know, a password in Dropbox or Adobe or any of the big third-party services, mm -hmm. there's a chance that information was at some point breached and released on the dark net. If you're still using that same password someplace else, it's out there. It's not a secret anymore. They know. They know where to go get it. it it's, it's all out there. And they're, and they're in they're your email, so they know your credentials now. They've seen an email from the bank you bank with. They've seen an email from the credit card company that you've paid a bill with. So they have how much of a chance of finding out that that credential they use to get into your email is the same credentials that they're going to be able to get into your bank account, your credit card, any other place that you use those same credentials on. So again, always comes back to the human element, does it not? You know, and, and Jeff, you mentioned that uh, if you have O365, so is that to say that, and as we move to the next screen here, and it says some techie things, I promise again, we're not going to have a quiz, but I want to touch on this here. So that first bullet point says email headers for external senders. One, what is it? What does that do? And can I find that on an open or free source email? Okay, yeah, um, the days of using free email pretty much should be considered to be over. Okay. They don't provide the security controls you really need to be operational mm -hmm. at, at this point in time. So, for instance, O365 is probably the dominant platform most counties are using. Um, O365 gives you some really good security tools that people need to be taking advantage of. One of the things it allows you to do is it allows you to identify if an email comes from outside of your domain. So I'll use my fictional Cartwright County. <laughs> if you're in Cartwright County and an email comes through that purports to be from Cartwright County and isn't, you can get a little banner on top that says, hey, pay attention, this is not from a trusted source. So that becomes a really important tool. And I know some of our counties are doing that, have that, because when we correspond, we see that banner that goes across. Uh, and I, you would say that maybe changing the color of the font, something placing it a little bit different also yeah. probably helps as well. Now let's go down to that second bucket there. There's a lot there. Jeff, of those things, which one is the most important to you and why? If I only had one, it would be multi-factor authentication. I can't stress this enough. Okay. If you don't have multi-factor in place, you will have an email incident, almost guaranteed. So, Lindsay, it looks like with we've multi-factor, from what you've seen on a day-to-day -day basis, is, is really, it's a layer of defense, but it's a big layer. It's a big layer, and at this point, it, 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 it's beyond best practice. It's absolutely critical um, because that is the next step so that if your credentials are compromised, whether it's because you kick on a, click on a phishing email or because a compromise co happens some other way, mm -hmm. um, that layer of authentication will keep that criminal actor from being able to access the email account using those credentials. Um, and it also serves as a bit of an alert. If you get an alert through multi-factor for a login that you are not initiating, mm -hmm. then that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong here. Um, and that would warrant a report to IT and changing a password and probably changing lots of other passwords just to make sure that all of your accounts remain secure. Um, it's absolutely critical and goes a long way to protecting information access and the network as a whole. So Jeff, it, it sounds like MFA multi-factor authentication is really kind of like what antivirus used to be, right? We used to hear about that all the time. Yeah, it's no longer optional. It's the best way to think of it. It's a great point. And Andrea, I mean, you know, 
we've got most of us multi-factor authentication. The banks, financial institutions have made that a requirement if you still want access to your systems, right? Correct. So no different for, for us in accounting. I, I want to go back to this email concept of, of using uh, something like Office 365 versus a, an open and a free source. I mean, if, if you're using that type of email, a free one, and you're conducting, I've got personal and I've got business on there, what are some potential dangers? And then I'll come back to Lindsay on that as well. Well, other than the lack of security I right? already mentioned, <clears throat> uh, we have the fact that if something does happen with that email that causes some sort of cyber liability on the county, there is a serious lack of evidence for us to be able to utilize to look into that incident. They just they, There's no logging or anything that Jeff and his team can really get into to help figure out what happened. And then, just as with any other situation, as far as counties are concerned, because they're a public entity, there's always the Public Information Act issues that come along with using personal email for county business. So, Lindsay, from, from a legal perspective, I, how, how risky the, the liability, if you will, of, of using an open and a free source email uh, when you're, you're conducting county business? It, it's incredibly risky, um, primarily from my perspective because of the lack of evidence. Um, we, if we know the security features are lacking, and they are, um, the idea that we don't have evidence to prove what happens in a situation of compromise, um, to set the parameters, um, and to be able to do a quality legal analysis, both from a liability standpoint when we're dealing with particularly um, wire transfer fraud connected to business email compromise. Um, you know, how do we figure out how this happened, who's responsible for where the money has gone, but also the question of just how do we assess our legal compliance obligations without that evidence. It's very difficult. Going back to our list here, so I think we, we already touched on use secure email services versus open source and free. Jeff, on that last one, you know, and that's probably for our IT professionals, but protect email servers, and there's a lot of acronyms in there. Give us the, the non-technical aspect of, of um, what that means. Again, tools like O365 allow you to go ahead and set up some security tools that allow you to ensure that email is actually coming from the domain it's purported to be coming from. So just validates the authenticity a little bit. Okay. So another set of tools that we've got there. Okay. I'm going to take a little pause. I'm going to look here at our chat. It's been pretty quiet. So again, if you've got a question, uh, this is a, a unique opportunity to have time to get your question into our panel here. You've got a forensic expert, a legal expert in data and privacy, and, and you've got our cyber claims program uh, supervisor here. So three individuals who you definitely want to know uh, beforehand, right? But obviously they're going to be there to assist you. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, Andrea, if a county, if someone happens to click and they've got cyber coverage with us, what happens? How, how are we, what resources are we bringing? Something counties need to keep in mind and be aware, just as with any other claim that you deal with that happens, certain things happen that creates liability on the county and triggers a duty for you to do something, a duty for you to do some sort of investigation. There may be uh, state agencies that have to be notified depending on what information was accessed. There may be certain law enforcement departments that have to be notified. There may be letters that have to be sent out. So there may be multiple people that need to be contacted and it's, it, it can be overwhelming. So your coverage with TAC RMP is like clicking the easy button. Just call us, call me, and I get these guys involved. <laughs> and that's all you have to do besides be on some calls with us and help us figure out what happened. We take care of the rest. Yep. So, so Jeff and Lindsay are going to be in the trenches there with mm -hmm. you. And I think one of the questions we get is, well, you know, when do we call law enforcement? Should we call law enforcement? Who are we talking to, Lindsay? And, and that's a big part of where you come in is helping the county navigate those steps. Absolutely. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, particularly if we have financial fraud and misdirected wires, um, we're going we're gonna to jump on the law enforcement angle as quickly as we can, uh, particularly if the timing is ripe to help us recover those funds. Um, but we're also going to work together um, to put together the evidence needed to report to law enforcement and investigate what's happened. 
um, and cooperate with the FBI or local law enforcement as needed based on the event. Um, and we're going to work together to help navigate legal compliance issues, recovery from the incident, um, identifying vulnerabilities in the environment, and doing everything we can to prevent a recurrence of something like this. Um, that's, you know, TAC puts together an army of people to help. Um, that's our goal, is to try to move through, investigate, recover from the situation, and leave the county in a better position when we're done. And help the county respond. I mean, these, this is high media. You have a ransomware attack, news is on it. So that's one of the things we help with as well, just to kind of help keep the county from maybe saying some words that they shouldn't <laughs> say. We don't, we're not quite there yet. The power of words. The power of words. Right, the power of words. And, and I, I think this also underscores the need that this other topic, that incident response, yes. right? Talking about it. What is our incident response to a BEC attack? Have we talked through that? And, and again, one of the benefits of being a member of the pool with cyber coverage is, as Andrea pointed out, we're that easy button for you. We're gonna be right there. The sooner you involve us, I can't tell you stress enough how much that makes a difference. It really, really does. And like I said, you don't have to worry about who do I call, when do I call them. We've got that figured out already for you. And timing is of the utmost importance. Jeff and his team needs to be able to get in there as soon as possible before any of that crime scene evidence is destroyed. Uh, that's an interesting point. You really do need to consider this as a crime scene. You need to preserve evidence. Uh, if IT comes in and flattens everything and restores from backup, um, all the evidence is gone. Um, and that we've found historically, I think both Lindsay and I, that the more evidence we have, the better answer we're going to get. And the better answer usually means less liability for the county. Would you absolutely, agree? absolutely. So, so very, really, really key, because there's a, there's a coverage aspect of that as well, is that you don't want to be flattening an email box or, or wiping away digital evidence because you could be limiting your coverage, not, not, not just with TAC, but any insurance provider out there. So you want to be very mindful of that. And again, this goes back to incident response. You know, who, what, when, where, and why. Very, very critical. I've got a question here from Christina, and I want to say thank you to Christina for uh, giving us a question here. So, uh, and, and whoever wants to take this one, are there any free multi-factor authentication systems available? Any that you would recommend? Jeff? Um, yeah. Um, there's a multi-factor authentication baked into 365, which okay. is good. Uh, there's Google Authenticator, which an awful lot of different applications will use. It's easy. It's just an app on your phone. Number comes up. It's a six-digit number. It rotates, I think, every 30 seconds or every mm -hmm. 60 seconds. Um, you know, it's, it's really pretty simple to use. So. Yep. And so, Christina, just to kind of separate that, right, probably for your county, that's, that's a discussion, hopefully, that's going on at, with the IT. The key stakeholders are having uh, those discussions on what makes sense for you as a county. And Jeff touched on O365, Office 365 has that already baked in. But for the personal, he mentioned some of those. And I think that's also a good practice for, for personal use. Google Authenticator, as, as Jeff mentioned, and, and others, Microsoft, Duo, and others, you find what works for you. Okay, uh, let's move on here. No other questions. So I want to touch on the traditional mindset. And you've probably heard this maybe in, in years past presentation. I think uh, Ronald Reagan coined this phrase, trust but verify. Um, I want to go to our panel here, starting with Lindsay. What's the shortcomings, if any, with that when it comes to cyber? As we've already talked about, we're talking about a criminal element and we're talking about the day to day, the day to day work we do and how it can be impacted by someone whose goal is to dupe you. That is what social engineering is. That is what business email compromise is founded on, the idea that I'm going to fool someone. So if we trust first and then verify, it means we're going to fall for it every time. Um, and so while that may be noble in your day to day conversations, um, maybe not so noble with your teenager. Um, when you're talking about your emails, we got to flip that on its head. We have to verify b before we trust because there are so many different ways that these threat actors try to fool us. We can't make any assumptions. Jeff, anything else to add on trust but verify why it falls short? No, I, I think you have to. I, I think that it's, um, it's no longer, you, you have to almost flip it over. 
you know, and, and, and I mean, I don't want to get ahead of us here, but <laughs> I would think maybe verify then trust might be an interesting strategy. Well, how about that? Let's see what comes up here, Andrea. <laughs> so best practice, what we say to stay cyber safe is what? Verify and then trust. What, so what does that look like for a county employee who's sitting in the treasurer or auditor's office? G give us a real world example of what does that look when we put it into practice? Uh, dealing with your vendors. You have a vendor wanting to change their wire transfer information for a payment. An employee emails you and says, I've changed my bank account. Here's my new bank account. Can you send my payroll here? And it could be an employee that you recognize their name. Mm -hmm. Email looks legitimate, Everything right? Everything looks legit. Uh -huh. uh, and then come payday. They call you and say, I don't, my paycheck didn't come through. What happened? That's a, that's a trust but verify situation. So to avoid that from happening, when those change of uh, transfer data information requests come through, just call them up. Again, not using the number on the email, <laughs> <laughs> but the number that you know them to, to be a true uh, number and just verify it before you make that, take that step to send that money. And again, this goes back to training. It goes back to people getting our um, county employees elected and appointed officials to understand what this shift is. And we have to verify in this digital world that we live in, because really almost everything is accessible to us in the power of our hands, right? Mm -hmm. That phone puts us in touch with anything and everything, right? When you're away, you're constantly in touch with the office because you have to be because of email. And so uh, it's that convenience, but that's, there's that susceptibility, sure. right? Um, really quick, Christina had a follow-up question. I want to make sure we hit this. Um, I'm meeting resistant implementing multi-factor authentication. Uh, any suggestions? Um, yeah. Um, usually, there's always a, a, a cultural, if you will, paradigm shift you have to address. That takes time. It takes time. People yep. want it to be easy. Uh, they don't want to put it on their personal phones. You get all kinds of, of pushback. I think then the alternative is you have to, to some extent, scare people. You really do. Um, you know, one of the things we've seen some organizations do is if you don't go ahead and have multi-factor, you can't connect your email from outside of your office. And that's relatively easy for your IT folks to set up if they're using O365. You can only hit it without multi-factor from a trusted IP location from within inside the office. But if people actually want the flexibility to be able to check their emails from the road, nights and weekends, they have to agree to participate. It's just all it gets down to. And one of the things I can add to that is we talk a lot about multi-factor involving an app on the phone that gives you a code because, frankly, that's probably the most um, user-friendly version. Um, but there are other options. Right. Um, and so sometimes it's about exploring situations where instead of having an app, the user would receive a phone call. Um, there's also, I think there are still some options out there that include separate tokens or keychains that would have a, a changeable code. Um, not as user-friendly for the group as a whole, but if you have some folks that are pushing back, um, explore different variations of multi-factor. And then, mm -hmm. as Jeff just mentioned, um, there are ways to limit when multi-factor is needed, namely from trusted IP addresses and trusted devices within a network and environment. Um, that's cooperation with IT to make sure that you've got all the appropriate settings, settings in your email product. Um, and to Christina's question, um, for, and Jeff alluded to it, there are a lot of options for multi-factor for personal use. So through your banking app or through your credit card apps. But when we're talking about multi-factor options for business use, the first place you start is what is your email product? What does it have built within it? Um, is it time to revisit that email product and perhaps consider something different Could be so that it has security <clears throat> features and options that the one you're using doesn't have? Um, if your current email product needs to have an interface with something different, um, that's something that all of us can help with. Um, and TAC is a resource to make sure, you know, our, our idea as a team of people to help is to help the counties make the best decisions to secure the environment. So attendees, again, you, you've heard it now from a forensic and a legal expert, the criticality, the importance of multi-factor authentication. To Christina's point, Andrea, coming to you, I mean, it, it really is 
Is there some inconvenience? Yes, possibly so. But how much more inconvenience and cost might there be if you don't have multi-factor authentication? Well, then I think that's what you have to focus on. Unfortunately, counties sometimes have to make difficult decisions when it comes to employee policies, what's required of an employee, and it may come down to some difficult decisions if you make this a requirement and you're getting refusal. There may be some discussions with HR or something that you have to have, but it is that critical that you take those steps and you're just going to have to deal with those conversations when they come around. It's that big of a security risk if you don't. Yep. I'll tell you this. Once a county has been a victim, I've found more often than not the judge is pretty willing to mandate everybody's going to go to multi-factor <laughs> and that's the end of it. Yep. So, you know, that unfortunately we do see those incidents basically forcing change. Yep. It precipitates a whole different way of thinking. And an employee who is doing pushback I mean, just remind them as well, one of the things that you are trying to secure and keep protected is their information as well. The, your HR department has their social, their driver's license, their home address, and that is one of the things that you are trying as, as a county to protect. Uh, I don't, it may or may not help, but I think it's an important piece of information that they try to understand. Yeah, Christina, so it's about the why, right? The why, and then tying it back to, to that individual user or, 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 or persons, right, is explaining that, but going back to getting the buy-in, it's talking with your key stakeholders so that they understand that risk reward, because there, I mean, there is, right? Um, we're not saying that multi-factor is gonna deter it 100%, but it goes a very, very long way to keep you safe and knocking these things down because the consequence is really going to be the cost of a claim, not just for legal fees and forensics, but your time, your time to recover and get back up and running, possible you know, reputational loss, there's political aspects to it. So a lot can come with it. And, and Jeff, to your point, there are solutions. We just need to be talking about it and what makes sense, what works best for you in your county. Mm -hmm. But again, it goes back to people, starts with, with the training. So I appreciate that, Christina. Thank you for your questions. And yeah, quick reminder, uh, Don Newfer on here in the chat. You know, if counties have their email uh, hosted and provided by CIRA, um, MFA is available for implementation. We've got that on there. So again, if you need more information on that, reach out to Don Newfer and her team uh, with Sierra when it comes to that. Um, hitting the home stretch here. I know we're, we've gone a little bit long, but the conversation I think has been great. Christina, thank you for your questions. Anyone else, please get your questions in. We always wanna leave you with some takeaways. Here on your screen, you've got training and resources. The first one I highlight there is, is the e-risk hub. Um, you will see that it requires a login and password required. I'm going to take Jeff's um, recommendation that everybody has unique uh, and complex passwords on there. You will. But give me a call. Contact me via email. That eRISC Hub is available to members who have cyber coverage with us. It's a one-stop shop, has a lot of resources, sample policies, best practices, things of that nature. I highly encourage you, if you can, if you're not there, get there. Um, that second one. NACO, National Association of Counties, Cyber Guide for County Leaders. Um, that's actually a download that we have um, that's in the pod. If not, you can um, email us for it. And it's, it's got 10 questions on how to start the conversation within your county. Non-technical questions, but good things to start this conversation for you. Um, Jeff, the Stop Ransomware website, that's from CISA. Uh, Good tips and tricks there? Yeah, excellent. They have some really good guidance, some, some good key takeaways. Excellent. Um, DIR, Texas Department of Information Resources. I know we're familiar with them. Lindsay, uh, I think they've got a lot of good information too. They can be very helpful. Um, it's a resource that's available to, to give some more detailed information and guidance, um, regardless of where a county is in their cybersecurity posture. Absolutely. And then down at the bottom, you see, again, a bunch of acronyms, but you see Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center and the Texas Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. Jeff, those two are, you know, they're aggregators of information and, and kind of sharing information back and forth, right? Yeah, they are. But uh, MSISAC in particular has really a, a host of, of great tools you can get. Uh, in some cases, they're free. In some cases, they're very low cost. 
Uh, I would encourage everybody to go take a look at that. Another thing while I have the chance, I'll point out that if you're still using a .org or a .com or one of those types of domains, you really need to be going and moving to a .gov. Uh, CISA now manages that. I believe it's free at this point. Um, and it's, uh, it provo provides a whole set of protections you won't have if you're just going ahead through GoDaddy and getting a .com domain. Gotcha. And the last one, Internet Complaint Center, IC3. That's the FBA, uh, FBI website. Lindsay, what is, what is that? What's the usefulness of that site? So predominantly, that is the site we use to report cybercrime to the FBI. Um, crimes like we're talking about. So that chart we saw at the very beginning yep. is a compilation of um, internet-based crimes that have been reported to the FBI through IC3.gov. Um, so that is the first source for reporting to FBI for law enforcement purposes. Um, and then Jeff and I both have contacts we would leverage as needed, depending on the type of incident and the timing. The more we report, what could be some outcomes? What's the benefit in the more we report? I mean, first and foremost, particularly from the concept of business email compromise, um, with timing and reporting, we might actually be able to recover funds. But secondary to that is cooperating with law enforcement on gathering information. Um, these are very sophisticated criminal actors, and in a lot of situations, they're also very organized. And so compiling our information with that of other victims can go a long way to try to stop some of this and, and bring some justice, ultimately. Okay. And in some cases, we can actually go ahead and share evidence with the Bureau. Uh, a lot of times they're asking us to give them things like indicators of compromise, uh, code, script we may find, things like that. And while they're not going to necessarily be able to run out and solve your crime, mm -hmm. it's a data point in a much bigger investigation. It can be very beneficial. Okay. Excellent. Again, just some few tips and tricks on the training and resources. We do have a copy of this uh, slide deck that you'll be able to refer back to it here. Um, as we close out, you'll see on the screen again, October means, yes, Halloween, uh, but also pumpkin spice lattes, right? Hopefully, I think here in Texas, we've ushered in a little bit of fall weather. Uh, we've gone from 100 to 94, so there's, there's that. Uh, but we'll take any, any reprieve that we will. But no, in all seriousness, down at the bottom, number three, October 1st kicks off the national campaign known as Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Uh, TAC is a champion of cybersecurity. Um, you'll see us listed on that site. Um, you know, from an industry perspective, it, it's, it's about awareness, right? Um, and so it's something that you as an individual contributor, a county, you could look at that. And also uh, they've got some neat uh, social media graphics, videos that you can push out, again, free to your employees to keep cyber top of mind. So it's an entire month focused on cybersecurity. I know from our side, be looking at the risk management pool Facebook. We're going to be having some things coming out on social media. Uh, Lee and Julie do a great job of, of putting that out there for us. Going to look at our chat really quick. Uh, I don't see anything else. Um, so questions, we've sort of been hitting that as we go along. You've got our contact information up there. Um, I do want to kind of, we've talked touched on the Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but customized training. So if you're a member of the pool and you've got cyber coverage with us, reach out to me. We are happy to come on site. Andrea have done some half day, all day workshops, and we can bring you a variety of different topics, everything from overall cyber best practices, cyber hygiene, business email compromise, and other things. I do want to remind our attendees that you've got four downloads. One of them is that NACO County Leaders Guide. The other one is 22 email red flags. Uh, it's just a one pager, laminate it, stick it up somewhere on a filing cabinet. It's just top of mind type of things. You've got that FBI internet crime report. Pretty dense, but what I like is it's got a lot of different information on there. Um, not just on BEC, but ransomware. I think you'll be shocked at some of the things that they're um, putting into that information there. And then from silent, we've got the 2022 silent threat landscape. What are they seeing from a forensic uh, perspective? So be sure to download that. If you cannot, email tacrcs at county.org, and we'll make sure we do that. I'm going to go to our panel. Anything else to, to add here in our parting moments, Lindsay? I think the biggest takeaway we've talked about is training against the human element and being vigilant. The threats are real, but that doesn't mean you have to be a victim. Multi-factor authentication. 
Use good email tools. Make sure you set them up properly so that you do maintain things like audit mm -hmm. loggings. We can go in if we have to, and we have some artifacts to work with. Andrea? Train, train, train. Uh, <laughs> report, report, report. And then have a response prepared and practice that response. Absolutely. I do want to take the time to, of course, thank you, our attendees, for giving us a little bit of your time, being here with us today, uh, for the questions that you've given us. We always enjoy. Thank you for what you do in your counties each and every day for your citizens. Uh, we're here if you need us, all of our teams. Uh, I do want to uh, thank also behind the scenes Lee Bell Hovland, who helps us put this together um, and does a lot of behind the scenes work. Thank you, Lee, for work on this and all the webinars. I do want to thank the man, the myth, the legend behind the camera, uh, Louie, who puts this production on. He does a fantastic job. And lastly, to my panelists here, you guys are excellent. It has been my honor, my privilege to be with you. Thank you for being here with us. You all have a great day.